Steve. Good morning, everyone. It's a privilege to be able to share with you this morning. And as we've transitioned from looking at an Old Testament book in the book of Hosea to re- coming back to Matthew for this next few weeks, let me lead us in prayer as we come to consider what God has to say to us today. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word. It illuminates our path. It guides us and directs us. Please open our hearts, eyes, ears and minds to respond to your word today, to think about how it applies to us in our lives and to respond in repentance and faith. Amen. Where do you go for security? There we go. People these days will go to extraordinary lengths to build security and it's one of those aspects of life that is littered with questions. Who do you go to for advice when it comes to building that perfect portfolio of shares, investment properties, high earning savings accounts, superannuation, so that you'll have the highest return in 10, 20, 40, 50 years time, or whenever it is that that retirement age comes? Is success guaranteed in your job, in your marriage, in your friendship circles, in your sporting team? Will the Blues win this evening? Will your fitness regime and your diet be the thing that unlocks lasting health and happiness in your life? Is your social media life incomplete if you you don't have thousands and thousands of followers or if your favourite celebrity retweeted one of your tweets? What's the best system to protect your house and your assets so that no thief can break in and steal things while you're away from home? Where do you go for security? Now, it's fair to say that as people go on and pursue security, they end up more insecure as the days go by, as what they thought was secure ends up being futile. Now, look at the past couple of months, look at what's happened with the stock market in the collapse of cryptocurrency, if you're into that sort of thing. Now, what's happened is people have invested many, many thousands of dollars. They've made even more thousands and thousands of dollars, but suddenly they've seen it come crashing down in what seems like the blink of an eye. Now, I think back over the past 24 or so months on how COVID has impacted people's travel plans, how it's impacted big birthdays, weddings, employment, health, and well-being. Now, life's full of these ups and downs. It's full of unexpected things that seem to clash with what the world says is true, right, and worth pursuing. Now, just like the kingdom of God and what Jesus says about it. Now, as I said earlier on, we're getting back into Matthew's gospel for the next few weeks. And for those of you who may need just a brief refresher, now, Matthew's primary aim in his gospel is to present Jesus as the Messiah, to present Jesus as the promised king that the Old Testament prophets said would come and restore the people of God and usher in a kingdom that would last forever. But the nature of this kingdom is upside down, it's back to front, it's not what you'd expect. Now, some of the things that Jesus does are not what you'd expect a king to do. This king associates with the people that the society of the day would say that should be avoided. Now, we have tax collectors, those who are generally falling into the category of a sinner. Now, things that are unexpected that he does, he heals deaf people, he heals blind people, he feeds thousands to the point where they are satisfied. He walks on water. Some of the things that Jesus says are not what you'd expect. Now, he says that instead of hating your enemies, you must love them. He speaks to crowds in parables, you know, stories that hold within them a special meaning of what the kingdom of God is. And some of the people that Jesus meets, you know, as mentioned before, he associates with the lowest of the low in society. He also associates and has challenges and arguments with teachers of the law and other people who hear the provocative message and... To put it simply, they just hate what Jesus says. They want to find a way to get rid of him. And those who encounter Jesus are inevitably challenged. And today in our passage, we have a contrast of encounters. Now, we have a group of people who are brought to Jesus and a man who brings himself to Jesus. And within this interaction, there's a contrast that will help us to see what true security is when it comes to the kingdom of God. But first of all, let's start looking at this man who seeks lasting security. And on face value, this man seems as if he has it all. Now, go back to verse 16 in chapter 19. If you haven't got your Bibles open, please open them back up to verse 16. You'll see this man 
brings himself to Jesus with what appears to be a simple question. Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Now, later on in verse 22, we'll see that this man is young. But I think in this young man, we see someone who knows that he will not remain forever young. Now, here's a phrase that stuck with me since I heard it about five or so months ago at LIT, which is a training conference that YouthWorks runs for senior youth who are um, keen on being part of church leadership. Um, The passages that were being spoken on at LIT were actually around this part of Matthew, and one of the particular speakers used this phrase, and it stuck with me since I heard it. Old people are young people wondering where all the time has gone. By that little giggle, I assume that some of you can relate, depending on where you're at in years. But when you make that transition from youth to adulthood, now you grow bigger, you grow stronger physically, you get richer, so on and so forth. And when you're young though, so when you're in school, sometimes that time can feel just so slow. Now school feels like it drags on and on and on. But before you know it, you've gone from that nervous, shy year seven kid who didn't really have a friend to a somewhat confident year 12 smarty, know-it-all, who has a part-time job on Saturdays and hangs out in one of the good groups at lunchtime. But then what happens, you hit 18, and it seems as if the playback speed just went to double. Now, especially, now you see those first grey hairs, you experience that first awkward kiss, you collect that piece of paper that sums up the qualification that you've spent year upon year studying to obtain. Now, when you say, I do, to the person who you have committed to spend the rest of your life with. Now, different things will happen to different people, but time will fly. Now, next year I turn 40. I feel like a young person who's wondering where all the time has gone. You know, what would have happened if I'd made that different decision here or there? Now, to tell you the truth, sometimes I think back over those things and I can be left feeling a little bit insecure. But here in the passage, there's a man who's young, rich, successful, someone who recognises that he needs something more lasting. A young man who would one day, God willing, grow old, and once he grew old to a particular point of time, he'd die. But this man knows there's eternal life to be had, and the question for him is how to get it. Now, what sort of loopholes can he jump through to get it? But how can he plan his life so he can get the prize he so desperately seeks. But in this question, there is a misconception, and it seems that Jesus plays upon this as he frames his response. In verse 17, Jesus says, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Now, for the typical Jew in first century Israel, there's some truth to that. To enter life, it was dependent on keeping the law. There was a relationship between good works and eternal life. Now, something we see, if you look back through the Old Testament, you you see the law that God gave to Moses to pass on to the people of Israel. Now, Jesus' answer here is pretty straightforward in that context. He says to this man, if you want to keep life or gain eternal life by your doing, you must keep the commandments. You must keep all of them. There's not one that you can skip. You must keep them all in the fullest sense. Now, yet we sense, now this inquiring man, you know, he may be a little bit uncertain. He may be still seeking that loophole. In verse 18, he asks, which ones? No, there may be that's that mental list in mind, you know, hoping that as this great teacher lists this command list off one by one, he can go tick, tick. Now, Jesus' response does seem a little bit peculiar, but it's a bit of a test for this young man serving the purpose of setting this man up to realise that he has something that he genuinely lacks. The thing that brings him to Jesus, whether it's his insecurity, whether it's his uncertainty, whether it's an intent to trap Jesus, it's a test. So in verse 18, we continue on. Jesus replies with commandments 5 through to 9 from the Ten Commandments that God gave Moses. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony, honour your father and mother. And a command from the Old Testament law that we find in Leviticus chapter 19, love your neighbour as yourself. 
You may have realized as going through that list, they're not all the commandments that God gave Moses. So what's missing? No, the commandment, do not covet. The commandment that relates to the desire to have everything and anything. And there's also the commandment that relates to putting the commandments, one to four, that relate to putting God over everything else. But it's a two-stage test here. Now, stage one, it seems promising. Now, in verse 20, this man declares when it comes to how he treats his fellow person, he's pretty decent. You know, he's what we would call a good moral citizen in our society. You know, the sort of person who sticks to the speed limit, goes through the self-surface checkout and puts their iceberg lettuce through as what it is, an iceberg lettuce. Or whatever is going up in price as the cost of living shoots up to levels that we may not have thought possible. But despite this moral goodness, this moral uprightness, now he comes up short. What do I still lack? At the end of verse 20. Now this alone tells us this man had not perfectly kept the law. Now as much as he would have liked to think he did, he didn't. He knows that there's something missing in his life, prompting this question, what do I still lack? Now, it's just as if he's saying to Jesus, you know, Jesus, I'm on the right road. According to your teaching, I am setting forth into the path that you say leads to eternal life. But why then do I not attain the rest of the true and godly life? This is where stage two comes in, verse 21. Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At the key to this man's relationship with God is not moral goodness. It's knowing who God is and where God needs to be in his life. Now, this wealthy young man has been corrupted by his view on wealth. Now, it's given him a sense of self, you know, self-sufficiency, self-sovereignty, self-power. Now, the delusion that he can do it all on his own. But this view has taken his view away from the view and taken his eyes away from God. The sufficiency of God, the sovereignty of God, the power of God, the one whose character and standard of living is revealed through the law. And it's here that Jesus tests where this man's true security and confidence is. Jesus calls him to a deeper love of his neighbor that goes beyond merely treating them well. And ultimately, as this man is called to return to God, he must follow Jesus. And for this man, in his context, in his situation, what does it mean? It means leaving behind the riches that he has set his heart upon, that he has built his security through, that he has put his confidence in as the way to by himself into the kingdom of heaven. Now, this man cannot ex expect to be saved on his terms. It's on Jesus' terms. No, those key words, follow me. Now, sure, this man has come and shown great humility in coming to Jesus, but his possessions owned him. And the decision, he can't make that sacrificial step. Verse 22, when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Now, you might be sitting here thinking, well, since this guy was told he had to sell everything he had and give it to the poor, does that mean that we should sell everything that we have and give it to the poor? Well, amongst many other things, wealth and riches can indeed entrap us. They can cause us to try and seek salvation on our terms. Now, wealth in and of itself is not evil, but it's the love of wealth that is a great danger. And those who are wealthy are vulnerable and they're prone to being controlled by their wealth. Now, our senior minister, Adam, spoke a few weeks ago. He took us to Luke's account of the parable of the rich fool. Now, here we had a man who was controlled by a growing harvest to the point where he sought and planned to build bigger barns to make the most of his growing investment. But he was told by God in a dream that as he would die, his plans were complete and utter folly. Now, it's all too easy for us to assume that as wealth builds, you know, as we enjoy that sudden and unexpected pay rise, you know, we'll assume we'll feel more safe, we'll feel more secure, more ready for retirement as that nest egg builds. But, you know, as, it, as it did for those who invested their fortune into cryptocurrency, wealth can vanish overnight. You know, the job that was once secure may all of a sudden become nothing. 
that a prized possession that you spent so many months, so many years, so many dollars building and crafting into the thing that you love may be stolen from under your nose. But maybe you're sitting there, you're thinking, well, you know, I don't really consider myself all that wealthy. Or you know, I don't necessarily feel entrapped by the pull of the almighty dollar. Let me encourage you just to have a think for a moment about the other aspects of your life that don't necessarily have a price tag linked to them, where you might be casting your eyes, ears and heart for security. Is it the success of your marriage? Is it the desire to be held in high regard in your friendship circles? Is it that diet you've just started or the regular gym sessions that you have in your calendar? Is it some other thing that you felt compelled to rush to if you feel worried or dissatisfied with your life? Now, is it these things that are getting in the way? Are they competing for your devotion to spending time with God in his word and prayer? Are they clashing with your commitment to fellowship here at Tom's? Are they clashing with your commitment to Bible study? Would you be sad if Jesus challenged you right here, right now, to cast your things aside so that you could follow him wholeheartedly with full devotion? Discipleship, it does involve tough decisions, and maybe where you are now, you may need to make a tough decision because you've been reminded that that other thing is not going to bring you the security that can only be found in Jesus and what he has done for you. Wherever you're at, friends, please be alert, be aware, so that your wealth or your misguided thought that you can do good to find favour by doing good things does not lead you to self-sovereignty because that in itself may be the worst handicap imaginable when it comes to eternal life. Now, having looked at this rich young man, we're going to go back into the passage and see what happens before this encounter as it provides us with the contrast and that upside-down aspect that we need to recognise when it comes to eternal life in the kingdom of God and how we go about finding lasting security. Let's go back to verse 13. Let me read from there. Then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them, but the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. Now, if you're familiar with Matthew's gospel or any of the gospels, you may know that there's a common theme that disciples, you know, the people, that close-knit circle of men who followed Jesus, they're a bit muddled, they're a bit forgetful at times. You know, they forget about what they are learning as they observe Jesus and are taught by him. Now, in our last period of talks, we didn't cover this particular part of Matthew's gospel. Can, can I invite you to just turn your Bibles, it may be on the same page, turn back to the beginning of chapter 18. Um, there's a similar situation that plays out, an interaction that the disciples have with Jesus. Um, if you don't have your Bibles open with you, please hear as I read from verse 1, where it says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them, and he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Now, I'm not sure how long it's been since this particular interaction um, and the one that we are looking at in chapter 19. But it may have just been long enough for the disciples to forget. After all, they you know, had been thinking about you know, what is greatness in the kingdom of God, and they may have been entrapped by that worldly thought that greatness comes from having a lofty position. But it may have been just long enough for the disciples to forget. Now, we read in our verse in chapter 19 passage that disciples rebuked those who brought their children to be blessed by Jesus. Right. And I can imagine that Jesus' reply would have been tinged with a little bit of anger. He would have been upset. And indeed, in Mark's account of this occurrence, we, say, we see that Jesus was indignant. And his words here in verse 14 are very similar to what they had heard not too long previously. Let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. 
and in a society where children were on the lower rung of society, along with sinners, along with tax collectors, they were as far removed from the rung that a rich young man would have worked his way up to. Jesus is elevating young children and using them as the example of what it is to be part of the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus calls for his people, his followers, to be childlike. But why? Why do we see that the example that Jesus puts forward is a child? This picture was taken about two months ago, and it's a picture of my newest niece, Madison. Now, look at the picture. Now, as you see the white blanket, as you see the little white bow that adorns her head, those daintily formed fingers and the wide open mouth that evokes thoughts and memories of one of those first precious breaths of life. Now, what sort of adjectives, what sort of describing words come to mind? I'll leave this open, though. Look at that picture. What sort of words come to mind when you see this? Just think of adjectives. Anyone? Cute. Cute? Innocent. <laughs> Innocent? Totally dependent. Totally dependent? Okay. One more, anyone? Well, vulnerable, yep. Well, Michelle mentioned one of these words, but yeah, two of the words that may come to mind, innocence and purity. But in the context of the story of the Bible, when we think about the disciples and followers of Jesus being childlike, these words don't necessarily make sense. Now, as we reflect on the nature of sin, how that affects us from birth, we cannot come to Jesus in innocence and purity. Now, remember the example of the rich young man. He thought that his mere compliance to the law and with the commandments could get him to eternity. Now, the law should have reminded him that because of his shortcomings and his sinful nature, he could not get to eternity that way. And we come to him in the complete opposite nature. We're not innocent. We're guilty of our wrongdoings. We're not pure. We're dirty. We're stained by the evil that stands up to God and defies him. But there were a couple of other words and one of them was mentioned. Um, as a story by Gary, it came to mind as you looked at that photo. Needy, dependent, no vulnerable, weak. Remember how the passage starts. Go back to verse 13. People brought little children to Jesus for him to place their hands on them and pray for them. Now, those children couldn't come to Jesus of their own accord like the rich young man did. Now, what can a baby do of their own accord as they enter those first years of life? Pretty much nothing. Now, who bathes them? Who lovingly changes those dirty wet nappies? Who nurses them? Who feeds them? Who wheels them around in a pram or cradles them in a specially made carrier because they're unable to walk. Now, for a little child, there is no security. There is no confidence. Because away from the nurturing love and care of their parents, there is no security. And that is why a little child illuminates the nature of the kingdom of heaven so, so well. Now, God willing, a child will grow from a helpless, needy baby into someone who learns how to walk, learns how to talk, be able to go to the toilet, clean themselves, move from using their hands to pick up food to using cutlery, now to ride a bike, to learn how to drive. But in the midst of all this change, now all of this moving from a physical level of dependence to the independence of adulthood, there is another level of growth that takes place. We grow in the awareness of how needy and dependent we are as children of God. Because the biggest need that we have is our need to be forgiven of the sin that stains us and renders us guilty. And we would be, rented guilt, we would be rendered guilty and condemned if it wasn't for Jesus meeting our greatest need by dying and being raised to life to deal with our sin. And we see in Jesus, he loved his neighbour above everything else. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, in verse 9, we see Paul write these words. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Now, our ultimate example is a man who hung on a cross. He was humiliated. He gave up everything. He thirsted. 
He was bereft of all his possessions. He was naked. He had no dignity. He had no security. Now, he came last when it comes to security in order to secure for us the kingdom of heaven. But he came first as he was raised to life so that we, as his children, could inherit the kingdom. The source of our lasting security is Jesus. So, friends, be childlike, but do not be childish. Now, Jesus never suggests that we become like children in every respect. Now, never are we to give in to every childish whim or temptation or assume that there is no responsibility for our actions. But like children, we are to be honest. We are to be open about how we feel, whether it's to God, whether it's with each other. We need to acknowledge that we are fragile, that we are vulnerable. And we need to acknowledge how much we need others, and most importantly, how much we need God. Now, like children who are generally enthusiastic and excited when you give them a gift, now, we're to be the same when it comes to the kingdom of God and eternal life. Now, we need to be dependent on Jesus' gift to us. We need to be ready to accept it as a gift that we do not deserve, but that Jesus, in his mercy and in his grace, has offered to us. Now, like children who can often be driven by an instinct to explore and discover and look forward to the future when a sometimes un- with a sometimes unquenchable curiosity. We need to explore and discover what God has for us in his word. We need to be teachable. We need to know that God's word has been granted to us to learn so that we can be equipped for the future. Because in the end, it would be an immense tragedy if you were to invest in the wrong thing and let your heart chase that which leads to despair, ruin, eternal separation from the God who created you, loved you, and saved you. So be secure in Jesus. He is the one we go to for security. Know that you do not need to live in insecurity. You don't don't need to wonder if there is anything that you still lack, anything that you still need to do to earn brownie points, because... Those who live in Jesus, those who trust in him, have nothing to prove. They have nothing to be anxious about because their eternal future is secure. Now, the security of knowing Jesus as your Lord and Savior should drive you to a life of sacrifice, service, giving for his sake, just like the life of Jesus. He sacrificed. He lived in service. He gave of himself. Because in the end, no one who lives for Jesus and invests in his kingdom is going to be left disappointed. They won't be left shortchanged. They will inherit eternal life. Let me pray. Gracious Father, thank you for the example of Jesus. Thank you that he, though he was rich for our sake, he became poor. Father, we acknowledge that there are many things in our lives that get in the way, whether it's riches, whether it's relationships, whether it's other things or the desire to do good things. We repent of those things and turn away from them, and we rejoice and run back to you, knowing that through what Jesus has done for us, we are saved if we put our trust in you. Please help us be dependent. Please help us to be like little children who are not in any sense or way innocent or pure, but help us to be little children who are needy, dependent, on what you have done for us. Amen.